Last week, I did a book review on The Fourth Turning is Here by Neil Howe. And this is a cyclical view of history book where he's noticing that roughly every 80 years, there's a war or a revolution of some kind, and that there's kind of these cycles throughout history. And his endeavor in this book is to look at the role of different generations during these different stages of history. And that, of course, includes the crisis stage, the rebirth stage, the awakening stage, and the societal decline stage, which he maps onto an 80-year period, and that 80 years is roughly the span of a human life. So he's looking at the characteristics of different stages of life, young adulthood, middle-aged adulthood, older adulthood, etc., and looking at what does it mean for that generation to be in that stage of life during a crisis moment or during a rebirth moment in history. So in this video, I would like to give my own version of my vision of the generation's relationship with a possible impending crisis and a possible impending rebirth moment in society. I also think there's value in what he's doing, and especially when it comes to envisioning the way different generations may need to collaborate, where they each bring their own unique set of talents that might be um, embedded in a life stage or a perspective on history that generations may have taken up as they've moved through history in different stages of life. I think that's a valuable exercise. And in particular, if there's some kind of coming crisis and rebirth, the younger generations may have more experience with technology, more of a social intuition about how human dynamics work inside digital environments. But then the older generations may have more of an intuition of uh, what is possible inside institutions that they've moved up inside. The older generation may have a perspective that's outside of the environment of this manipulative online space. And that outside perspective, I think, could be really essential. So we kind of need these two groups coming together. And one thing I appreciated about this was that he had a whole section at the end about the rebirth period, the rebuilding of society that happens after a crisis. And he makes the analogy with the seasons where the crisis moment is the winter, the fourth turning that is. But then after a fourth turning comes the first turning, the rebirth period. And I think it's really healthy to be looking past the crisis to the moment when we have an opportunity as society to come together and restructure things and rebuild new different types of institutions. Because in some ways, if the focus is on the lead up to the crisis, there's going to be a lot of blame and pointing fingers and anger. And if the focus is on the crisis moment itself, there's going to be a lot of fear, which of course leads to anger and hatred and um, people, people do not react well coming from a place of fear. But if the focus is on the hope after the crisis, then in some ways I think that could pull us through a crisis in a way that is healthier, that is less destructive. My approach here is going to be to lay out specific traits that are each going to be centered around a particular generation, but distributed across all the generations. And these, are, of course, are going to be traits that are necessary in the rebirth period after whatever crisis happens. And the reason I'm using this distribution model is because I was kind of annoyed by the stereotypes of generations whenever he talked about them, even though I totally recognized the value of what he was doing here. So this is how I'm getting around that problem and talking about this in a way that will not annoy myself. Now, this book named the millennial generation, the hero generation, according to the framework of four different generations that he's setting up in this book and in his prior books. Now, that to some degree rubbed me the wrong way because I actually think every generation will have important traits and important roles where they need to act as the hero. And so my goal here is really to spell out what are some of the traits that are located perhaps on average in different generations, though spread across many generations, what are those traits that if someone has that trait, they have a role as a hero role in the coming crisis and 
and especially in the rebirth after the crisis. My first trait here is going to be retirement status. And obviously this one's going to be centered squarely in the middle of the boomer generation. And the reason I think this is important is because I think there's a lot of value in having economic independence from employers in the current system. And part of the way I started thinking about this was there was a series of conversations I've had with faculty in the Heterodox Academy. And of course, the Heterodox Academy is all about having multiple viewpoints within academia, uh, making sure that um, when there is orthodoxy and when that is rigidly dogmatically enforced, there are people who sort of speak up and say, wait a second, there are multiple viewpoints here worth considering. And in that context, there was a dialogue between faculty who were nearing retirement and younger faculty about who should speak up in these moments when it's really clear that some kind of orthodoxy is being enforced. And the younger faculty said to the older faculty, you should speak up because there's lower risk for you. Like if the whole community turns against you, you're retiring in two years, it's not as big of a deal. But then the older faculty response to that is, we don't actually understand the social dynamic that's going on here. Like there are a whole bunch of words where if you say those words, like it's going to cause uproar, it's going to cause misunderstanding. And doing an effective job of speaking up requires being sensitive to the social dynamic, it requires knowing what words to avoid, what pitfalls to avoid, and the older faculty said, we're just not as in tune with that whole dynamic. And both of these groups actually had a pretty good point, I think. So I'm going to talk about this both at the end when I'm talking about advantages younger generations have, but also right now, I do think the younger faculty are correct, that there is something about the lower risk position that retired people and near retired people have, where some things are lower risk for them because they're not as economically dependent on the current system. My next relevant trait that I'm going to center maybe in the boomers or maybe in the younger boomers more toward Generation X is going to be offline status. And this is basically just people who don't get sucked into the online vortex where there's a lot of emotional manipulation going on. And I think there's something about what the online space does to the human brain and nervous system such that it's really helpful to have people who are outside of that space, who can perhaps look at the people who are all being sucked into this phenomenon and can maybe like sort of critically evaluate, this seems really off or really emotionally charged in a way that doesn't quite make sense. And they can discern actually that thing they're talking about, that makes sense even to me, who's someone who's not sucked into the online environment. And a few years ago, I actually met someone my own age who wasn't online. Like he didn't have internet, he didn't use the internet that often at work. And there was just something really different about his brain space. It's like, you know, when you're getting to know someone, you're trying to figure out where is their brain space? How do they think? What are they thinking about all the time? And there was just this noticeable difference with him that not being online created in some ways a kind of calm that was like steady and not, not all hyped up, not all anxious. It was really powerful, I thought. And having some people who, were, who can look at the online emotional stuff objectively when they encounter that in other people, I think that's going to be helpful. Because I do think we have this phenomenon where normally people hold each other in check in terms of their sanity. Where if one person's sort of getting really riled up and emotional about something that is just out of proportion with how emotional that thing should be, the people around them will kind of ground them and kind of sort of bring them back to a steady state in a really healthy way. 
But the problem with the online environment is if you have everybody getting riled up emotionally at the same time, in the same direction, or maybe in polarized directions, maybe they're going in opposite directions, but both very emotionally charged. There's nobody around that, those people to actually ground them and sort of uh, hold up a mirror or even just recognize that, okay, the emotional charge behind this thing that's being promoted or being pulled in online, that's actually not as rational as it may seem in this exact emotional moment. And this actually gets at my next trait, which is the wisdom trait. And obviously, older adults have always been associated with wisdom. I'm actually going to center this trait right between Generation X and the Boomers, where that wisdom is partially the wisdom of how you handle setbacks. It's the wisdom of resilience in, in light of issues. It's the wisdom of sort of having that experience of life and putting life in perspective. And this came to light for me when I taught a course a few years ago on aging. And it was so fun, I got to co-teach this course with a psychology professor who studies aging. And I was the economist who studied healthcare systems and aging, and we, we did this together. But we invited older adults to come into our class with these 20-year-olds, and they would talk about various things together. And there was one day when we were talking about sort of setbacks and or things during life, and the younger adults had things like um, breakups with a boyfriend that were really, really emotional, and they, they talked through, you know, sort of how did they get through that. But then you go around the table and hear everyone else's story. And I mean, on the other side of the table was the older adults who are looking back past an entire lifetime and looking at what was the thing that was hardest to come back from. And it was like, it was like I lost a child, like my child died. And there's just something about the perspective of an entire lifespan that brings a type of wisdom that I think is so healthy and so needed and also so grounding because it's not right to dismiss the young adult who, who has a breakup. Like their emotions are real. Their emotions deserve empathy and attention and validation. But at the same time, having people who can put that in perspective of a lifetime, that's just, that's just so important. Now my next trait, which I will also center right between the boomers and generation X, is going to be experience of institutional change. And the boomer generation has seen a lot of institutional change, in part because they changed every institution they went through. Like starting with kindergarten, they came into the kindergarten classroom as a huge cohort that the school system actually had to rapidly expand to meet the demand for kindergarten classrooms. And because it was this sort of huge generation, as they went through the system, every institution had to expand to, to have the capacity to handle them. And that rapid expansion oftentimes came along with institutional change. And of course, once the boomers were adults, they were oftentimes leading that institutional change as it, as it moved forward. So having people who have seen how institutions change from the inside and have these insights about human dynamics in that context, insights about what works and doesn't work, that will be important. My next trait is going to be life experiences in a non-digital world. And of course, I'm going to center this in the middle of Generation X. I'm an ex millennial myself, and I had a childhood that was analog and a teenagehood that was um, beginning to have the internet, but not really, um, not really in its fullest social media form. And I think there is something of value to seeing what the world looks like without those manipulative forces. Because I am convinced that the manipulative aspect of social media is one of the things that most needs to be transformed and that's most destructive in the current environment. And to be able to envision what's possible without that manipulation, 
or what a healthy society looks like when everybody isn't getting emotionally charged in the same direction at the same time. That kind of wisdom from knowing what's possible I think is going to be important. So having people with actual life experience before the internet age, I think that trait will be essential in the rebirth. My next trait here is going to be leadership. And I will place this squarely in the center of Generation X in terms of its center of the distribution. Because I think leadership requires many years of experience. It requires an element of trial and error and like seeing how things go wrong when you lead and doing it better next time. And that takes a lot of time. Now, why don't I center this around uh, the boomer generation? And I think part of this has to do with the fact that there are different types of leadership. And the types of leadership we might need in the future might involve technology, they might involve newer types of leadership. Like leading a, a basic startup might be a little bit different on average than leading a tech startup. And Generation X, I think, has more experience with leading tech startups and leading organizations that just exist in the modern context a little bit more. Now, there's also sort of slow building up leadership and quick building up leadership. And one thing I worry about for the younger generations is that if artificial intelligence eliminates a lot of the entry-level jobs and entry-level positions, and if it eliminates the lower levels of a company, then the younger generations may not have that same slow pathway up to leadership where they understand how the institution works, they get experience in many different departments in the, in the institution before they reach those leadership roles. And that's not always going to be a bad thing. Like, I do think there can be a lot of benefit in bypassing moving up within an institution for reasons I won't even go into here. But like, I think that could be valuable to go from someone with very little experience to someone who's leading an organization. In fact, you may not absorb the institutional biases if you go quickly into that role. But there's also some stuff that you lose by not moving up slowly and observing many people in that institution. So leadership is a broad category, but I'm centering it around Generation X. My next trait is the bridge building trait. And this is basically a person who can help bridge the communication gap between two different types of people. Where this could be cross-generational, it could be cross-cultural, it could be cross-technology ability. So I, I'm placing this one in the center of the ex-lennials, that's the, that's the generation I am, which is right in between the millennials and generation X. And the reason I'm placing it as young as that is because I think the millennials have more experience being the bridge between people who are young and know technology really well and people who are older and don't know the technology. So I think that will be an important bridge of the future. But the reason it's a little bit older, the reason I think older people may have an advantage sometimes in this, is it takes a lot of experience. And I think the, the deepest type of bridge building is bridge building across cultures, where if you've lived in another culture or spent time working in a workplace where you have to talk to people across cultures, that experience on how to do that well it takes time and it takes sort of understanding and it takes patience and it takes um, loosening your own views of how people think or how, uh, how language works. So that skill I think will be essential. So if there's going to be a rebirth, a rebuilding period, and if that's going to bring everyone along, it's going to need a lot of people who will help bridge the gap between groups who currently don't understand each other. So that, so that a new system, for example, can serve all of those groups together. My next trait, which I will also center around the ex is going to be face-to-face -face communication skills and just in-person skills in general. 
And this is, of course, reading people's body language, learning how to watch what's happening in a group and understand what are the social group dynamics as they play out, not just by tone, but also by physical movement and rhythms in the group. There, there's a skill that goes along with human relationships in the physical real world. And I think that is going to be essential because in some ways, rebuilding society will require the grounding and the healing and the way that physical presence of human beings uh, treats loneliness better. It addresses some of the societal problems of people drifting apart and people not forming as many communities as in the past. So I think we're going to need people who have built up that part of their brain that attunes to social skills in the in the in-person space. We need people good at that. Now my next trait is going to be pure technological proficiency. And I'm centering this around the millennials because of course technological proficiency is going to be easier for people who have grown up with technology, who have like a deep intuition about how do you navigate a new social media site that's different from what you've seen before, but it also kind of builds upon the expectations of your generation in the past. And I mean, I definitely get this sense from my students that they can pick up technology really quickly, like way more quickly than I could just because I don't have as much training of my brain of learning new technologies. My next trait I'm going to center between the millennials and Generation Z. So I don't know if there's a name for this generation, but z Lennials seems about right. And this trait is going to be social intuition in the context of the digital environment. Now, this will include the way that the digital environment and the social dynamics there move out into the real world space. For example, when I mentioned a minute ago that sometimes the faculty who are nearing retirement, they don't want to jump in and try to speak up or try to uh, get involved in something that might not be good because they don't fully understand what's going on. They're, they're like, there's something weird going on here. There's a social dynamic I don't understand. It's a younger person's thing. And that intuition they have is not wrong. Like there are social dynamics that are deeply influenced by the digital environment. So if you don't understand how does this meeting, this board meeting or this uh, faculty meeting, how does this relate to what people are processing from the digital space, then you won't fully understand the social dynamic going on. And I think, especially Generation Z, the social part of their brain, and humans have a major part of our brains devoted to the social environment, much of that has developed in the context of technology. So they're very attuned to how do people validate and invalidate each other in digital contexts. They're in tune with how do entire communities sort of move in a certain social direction based on social cues online. And yes, I think the term social cues online is the right term. It's learning to read what are the power dynamics here who's bullying who in this situation, and will people, uh, will people bully me if I stand up to that person? And if you don't understand how to figure out who, who has the status to bully somebody else, then you're not going to get um, the social dynamic at all. So I think attunement to the way human social dynamics work in the context of technology, that's going to be essential in figuring out a rebirth of a system that involves technology, which it almost certainly will. My next trait is kind of related to this, and this is going to be intuition about how collective action works in the context of technology. Because I actually do believe that some really powerful form of collective action is the biggest hope for the future. 
And yet, we've only seen collective action working in ways that don't have the protections against tyranny. Like the protections that liberal values of the olden days were trying to uh, protect human rights and human due process and all that. That's not currently present with collective action online. And cancel culture is actually an example here where cancel culture is trying to be a tool of collective action. And of course, the problem is that it's a tool that can be used for oppression as well, where, you know, there's not really due process. It can be hijacked for use by the powerful against the powerless. And that that's certainly a problem. It's why many people do not trust cancel culture to, uh, to effectively enact collective action. But if you think back to the Enlightenment and the liberal values around the Enlightenment, there were similar issues around collective action tools, including democratic tools, where you could have tyranny of the majority, you could have a variety of ways that um, that tool that's intended to uh, enact the greater good ends up being turned against the people in general, and checks and balances on power, due process, free speech. There's a, a variety of add-ons that the liberal enlightenment came up with to try to protect these tools for better use. And in some ways, the way I'm viewing this current moment is we have some powerful new digital tools that could theoretically be used for collective action in a positive way. But they're not going to work well unless there are add-ons and checks and balances that protect against some natural forces that will use those tools against the people or will use those tools for oppression of a variety of groups. Because nobody denies the power of cancel culture. And if that power could be wielded in a healthier manner, I think it could be transformative. And it's not going to be wielded in an effective manner without an understanding of digital online social dynamics. And then my last trait I'm going to center around Generation Z. And it's a little bit hard to explain. I'm going to call this an economic perception about the future. That, that's what I'll call it. And in some ways, this is parallel to the one I started with in the older generations, where the older generations who are retired have a certain economic perspective that can be independent from the current system. I think there's something almost parallel to that in Generation Z, where their brains are trying to fit themselves into the society of their future. They're trying to imagine a pathway, a career pathway that they could lean into. And I think for many of Generation Z, what they're finding is that they can't quite envision that because I think they've seen how Generation X and the millennials, they've tried to move up within a system. They've tried to find their way toward meaningful roles. And much of that process has been delayed and put on hold. And um, people in these other generations have gotten stuck lower on the rung of society than they would have intended. So I think many Generation Z people have difficulty imagining themselves into the future. And I think some of that is actually really good intuition about the problems with the system we exist within. And this is very much a right brain kind of thing, where the right brain is good at scanning the entire environment in all of its complexity and kind of sensing out where there might be an issue and what might be going on, just in a vague intuitive sense. And because of that, I think Generation Z has, to some degree, a heartbeat on the system and the problems with the system that would need to be protected against and built in a different way in designing a future in any rebirth. 